Will skyscrapers collapse in an earthquake? Can an earthquake split the ground and swallow everything in its path? And just how earthquake proof are your buildings? We're going to be debunking earthquake engineering myths today. Hi, I'm Matt Picardle and I'm a licensed structural engineer in California. I design buildings so they stand up and don't fall down during earthquakes. Let's jump into it. Myth number one, skyscrapers are dangerous in earthquakes. This question came up a lot during the recent New York and New Jersey earthquakes. My cousin was even telling me that he was on top of one of the tallest buildings in LA and he looked down and said, man, I do not want to be in this skyscraper if an earthquake hits. I said, what modern skyscrapers are some of the safest structures to be in during an earthquake? And here's why. Tall buildings shake less than shorter buildings in nearby earthquakes. The ground shakes in a rapid high frequency motion, causing smaller buildings to shake violently, while taller buildings just don't shake much at all. In Japan's 6.9 magnitude Kobe earthquake, over 200,000 mid to low rise buildings were destroyed, while tall high rise buildings suffered no major damage. But skyscrapers, they have a weakness. They sway a lot more if they're farther away from an earthquake. That's because the ground shaking at that distance takes on a slower back and forth movement, causing them to resonate and sway largely. Tall buildings behave similarly to a swing. You don't get it to sway higher by rapid short pushes. No, you take longer, slower pushes. But don't worry, modern skyscrapers are designed to sway. That's why advanced engineering earthquake technologies are often found in them, such as shock absorbing braces or mass dampers that help reduce building sway. Lastly, modern skyscrapers are more rigorously designed and peer reviewed compared to typical buildings. Structural engineers often make computer earthquake simulation models of these skyscrapers to stress test them for possible earthquakes in the area. And these models are often so complex that they take hours, if not days to run the simulation. If that wasn't enough, the calculations and designs also have to be meticulously reviewed and approved by a panel of engineering and earthquake experts. That was a lot of reasons. I hope you feel a little bit safer about being in skyscrapers. Myth number two, earthquakes split the ground open and swallow everything in its path. No, this is so false. This is just not true. Earthquakes do not work like that. The ground doesn't just split apart and swallow everything in sight. And I know you're gonna bring up the Turkey earthquake footage where the headlines read, Turkey earthquake creates massive chasm in Olive Grove. We'll get to that. I remember watching a movie trailer for San Andreas when I was a student. It's the earthquake movie with The Rock. And there was this one scene where there is a big earthquake and the ground just splits wide open, forming a massive canyon, tears a building apart, swallows it up and everything around it. First I thought, whoa, that's crazy. What if that really happens? And then I remembered what I learned in my earthquake engineering classes. And it ruined me from wanting to watch the movie. The Earthquake movie magic was dead to me. And now I'm going to ruin it for you. In order for there to be a big earthquake, you need friction. And this friction is caused by the Earth's crust rubbing against each other at fault lines. Two plates can crash into each other at the fault lines. They can shear past each other in a strike slip fault. This is the type of fault that caused the Turkey earthquake last year, or they slide away from each other. Now, if the plates of Earth just rapidly split apart from each other, causing a huge canyon in the ground as seen in the movies, well, there's no friction there. No big earthquake. Sure, faults can cause fissures in the earth, but typically only a couple inches wide and a few feet deep. And the Earth's crust does move apart from each other at some locations in the world, such as the Iceland Rift, but these take millions of years to even get that big. So no, earthquakes don't just split apart and split the ground open and swallow buildings, but earthquakes can cause the ground to liquefy and that can swallow up and sink buildings. That's a phenomenon called liquefaction. And in the case of the Turkey earthquake where the ground looked like the earth split apart and caused the chasm, that was caused by landslides that were triggered by the earthquake. As you can see in these before and after photos, if the earth split apart that much, the markers shown here would have moved the same amount, but they stayed in place and the damage seems to be concentrated in a local area. Meaning the chasm wasn't created by the earth splitting apart, but instead the weak earth collapsing in on itself due to the landslides caused by the earthquake. Maybe there was some weak soil underneath those cliffs or maybe there was a sinkhole. That doesn't change the fact that an earthquake did cause this and it's just that the earth technically didn't split apart. 
more like the earth collapsed and caved in on itself. Myth number three, buildings are earthquake proof. False. Modern buildings are not earthquake proof. They are earthquake resistant. But what do I mean by that? Just how safe are buildings engineered to be in earthquakes? Our design philosophy as structural engineers for engineering buildings to withstand earthquakes, particularly here in California, is similar to the philosophy of a car crash. If you're in a small car accident, you may have a ding on your bumper. No big deal structurally, you can still drive. In a medium car accident, your bumper may be damaged and you may need to repair it, but you can still drive, you're good to go. But in a big car accident, your car may be so damaged that you may need to get a new one, but you, you are okay, you are safe, your life is safe, you can evacuate the vehicle. That's similar to buildings. If a small earthquake, let's say a 4.0 magnitude or lower hits, little to no damage to your structure. Medium earthquake, maybe around a 5.0 magnitude, your house should still be fine, but there may be some small structural repairs here and there, you can still live in it. But if a large earthquake hits, let's say a 7.0 magnitude, our main thing as structural engineers is to make sure that building doesn't suddenly catastrophically collapse after the big one. So it gives you enough time to evacuate the building and get to safety. Your life is safe. Now your building may be completely wrecked and you might be homeless or your office will have to close down and be torn down, but at least you're safe. Structural engineers can make a building nearly earthquake proof, but we can't technically say earthquake proof because our designs are based on statistics and probability. In California, for example, we design buildings for the 2500 year earthquake, meaning the biggest earthquake that we think can occur once every 2500 years. But we can't guarantee that a bigger earthquake won't occur. Therefore, structural engineers design buildings so there's less than a 1% chance of your building suddenly collapsing to an earthquake in the next 50 years. That's very low. For example, in California's Northridge 6.7 magnitude earthquake back in 1994, around 240,000 buildings were affected by the earthquake, but only 2,000 collapsed. Less than 1% collapsed, and many of those collapsed buildings weren't even up to modern building codes. And in Taiwan's recent 7.4 magnitude earthquake, there were a reported 28 building collapses out of the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of buildings affected by the earthquake. So structural engineering works. Unfortunately, the media doesn't always do a great job of portraying that because safe buildings aren't necessarily great headline grabbers. That's why all you saw on media for the Taiwan earthquake was this building that collapsed. Myth number four, stronger is better for earthquake design. Stronger usually is always better for building design, but not necessarily for earthquake building design. Why is that? That sounds counterintuitive. Stronger often means making your building stiffer and the stiffer you make your building, the more seismic force it attracts. Imagine your fist is the earthquake and the building is a strong, stiff object like a wall. If you smash your fists into the wall, there's a lot of direct impact force there. Your hand is going to hurt. And since the wall is so stiff, it's also brittle and suddenly got smashed to pieces. Now imagine that you smash your earthquake fist into a flexible building. Let's say it's represented by one of those standing punching bags. There's a lot less impact energy there. Your hand is fine and the building is also fine because it's flexible. That's why we design buildings to sway and have some flexibility, especially high rise buildings. So we can reduce earthquake forces. Structural engineers also design buildings with seismic energy absorbing technology to lower the earthquake forces on the building even more. They can do this in different ways. They can use sacrificial members in the building that intentionally get damaged and bent, but not broken, to absorb the seismic forces. Think of it as your car's bumper that's designed to crumple in order to absorb the impact damage. Engineers can also use fluid filled dampers that act as shock absorbers when an earthquake hits and helps reduce building sway. The fluid in these dampers essentially slows down the earthquake forces. Imagine in our earthquake fist example that you're underwater this time and now you try punching the wall. Your earthquake fist is slowed down underwater, reducing the damage you can do to the wall. That's how these fluid filled dampers protect the building from earthquakes. And one of the best methods of seismic energy absorption is base isolation, where you essentially separate the building from the ground. Think of it as putting the building on a bunch of ball bearings. So as the earth shakes violently, the building barely moves because it's essentially floating from the ground. Myth number five, 
under a doorway is the safest spot to be in during an earthquake. Today, absolutely false. This myth may have originated from older construction photos where the only thing left standing after an earthquake was a door frame. But today, a lot of modern buildings have walls that are actually non-load bearing, meaning they're not designed to hold any weight nor the building up, meaning that they're flimsy and they will definitely not protect you at all if the building collapses. So what should you do during an earthquake? Well, the tried and true advice of drop, cover, and hold. Because as you know by now, the chances of the building totally collapsing suddenly are very low. That's not the thing you should be worried about in an earthquake. You're more likely to get hurt by a large shelf, a TV, or a heavy object falling on top of you. So get under a table, drop, cover, and hold. Stay away from windows as they may shatter, and do not go outside until the earthquake is over because the building's facade may have bricks or glass fall off of it during the earthquake and smash you in the head and then you're dead. If you wanna know what the most dangerous building types are during an earthquake, or maybe you wanna see a real wooden skyscraper go up against a 7.0 magnitude simulated earthquake, check out these videos here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.